Ladies and gentlemen, let me take you on a journey to the outer solar system, uh, to a place strange and familiar to our own, an icy moon of Saturn called Titan. I'd like you to, take you, to take you through this adventure of exploring Titan. Um, Titan is a moon of Saturn, the sixth planet away from the sun. You see Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and then Saturn. Um, and, and Saturn has moons, like Earth has a moon. It has many moons. You can see some of them on the right there. And, and Titan over on the left is casting its shadow on Titan. So the black spot there is Titan's shadow being cast on, uh, on the planet Saturn. And you can also see Saturn's rings here. You can see that in addition to the obvious aesthetic value of this picture, there's actually something significant that I'd like you to notice here. And that, that is that Titan has an atmosphere. Titan is veiled with this uh, orange glow that um, prevents us from seeing its surface. And, and this makes Titan very interesting because it's the only large moon in the solar system to have um, uh, an, a substantial atmosphere. It's the only moon to have a, a substantial atmosphere. And this made Titan uh, a very important target for discovery in the last uh, decade or so. And, and I'd like to share that with you. Um, we couldn't see through that atmosphere until um, we sent the spacecraft there. And, and and that happened with the launch of the Cassini spacecraft. You see here the spectacular night launch captured at Cape Canaveral of Cassini headed towards uh, the outer solar system. And uh, Cassini was quite a spacecraft. It's, it's the size of a small bus, and maybe a mini bus. It's got instruments bolted in every direction on the spacecraft. It's got an antenna to communicate with Earth. It even has a component that the Europeans are very proud to have built called Huygens that you see as separating away from uh, Cassini and, and actually landed on Titan. So, so the process of discovery of Titan has really been something that's been very exciting. And, uh, and I want to share with you some of the things that we have found. Uh, the first question that we wanted to ask is, is what is Titan made of? What is, what is it on the inside? Um, you see that um, uh, Titan may have a liquid water ocean. And we wanted to understand whether, indeed, underneath this icy crust of a very cold planet all the way out in the solar system, whether there is liquid water. Uh, Saturn and Titan along with it is 10 times further from the sun. Therefore, it gets 100 times less sunlight and is 200 degrees colder. So you wouldn't expect liquid water there. But it may be that some internal heat inside Titan heats it and, and melts its interior. So in order to understand whether Titan is squishy on the inside, we did the same experiment that you would do in your kitchen with an egg. The way I do this is I actually take the egg and spin it, and then I stop it. And if the egg is soft boiled, then uh, the inside continues to move, even though I stop the outside, and then the outside starts jiggling around. And if the egg is hard boiled, then when I stop it, it just stops. So, so this is how you tell the difference between a squishy, soft boiled, and hard boiled egg. The same exact experiment is now being performed by the spacecraft around Titan. Saturn comes around, or Titan is in orbit around Saturn, so every time it come, goes by Saturn, uh, Saturn gives it a little bit of a kick, a gravitational kick. And you can tell whether Titan is squishy on the inside or hard on the inside by how it spins. Does it spin like one solid body, or does, it, does the shell spin decoupled from the interior by, by this squishy layer? I'm going to take you through some pictures now of the surface of uh, Titan. And I hope that you will appreciate, like I do, how Titan is just at once so, such a strange place, so much colder, materials are all different but uh, at once familiar to our own experience on Earth. And this is the first of the pictures that I want to show you. This one is a, a set of dunes, a dune field on Titan. There are hundreds of kilometers long, hundreds of miles long, a couple of, a couple of miles apart. And, um, and for those of you who have traveled around, you might recognize some dune fields on Earth that look remarkably similar to those on Titan. This is an example from the Namib Desert. This is a picture that was taken um, by an astronaut holding a handheld camera out the window of the shuttle. And, and you can see the dunes are very similar to the ones on Titan. They're hundreds of miles long. They're, they have similar geometries to the one on, ones on Titan. And in fact, just recently, myself and a team of NASA scientists went to uh, the Sahara Desert, to Egypt, to study how the dunes there form uh, in an analogy to, to Titan's dunes. Uh, this picture is one that shows channels on Titan. You see they have, again, familiar forms. They meander around. They twist and turn. They merge together. They drain into large valleys. And you might ask, what are channels doing in this cold place all the way uh, far from the sun, 10 times further from the sun? The answer is that liquid water that typically carves channels on Earth is, is not present on Titan. I mean, on the surface of Titan, 
uh, water is as hard as rock. It is ice, and it is as hard as rock, because ice at such cold temperatures is very, very strong. But there is another material that can melt on, at Titan's temperature, and that's methane. Methane on Earth is gas, but at Titan's temperature and pressure, methane can be liquid. And indeed, methane rains from the sky, falls on the ground, drains into channels. The channels collect together and uh, empty into large basins. And the geometries of those channels are, again, all too familiar to our own experience here on Earth with liquid water carving channels into rock. So on Titan, the methane is, carved, is carving channels into water ice crust. And on, on Earth, liquid water is carving into rock. And here's a picture that a friend of mine took from an airplane window showing similar scale, similar geometries, meandering channels um, somewhere near Parker, Arizona. So uh, Cassini got to... Um, uh, Sat the Saturn system. Cassini is this uh, spacecraft here. And uh, every time it flies by Titan, uh, all the uh, we try to point the instruments towards Titan and make measurements of it. Um, one of the things it did is it released this Huygens probe that uh, descended through Titan's atmosphere. It gave it a little bit of a spin in order to uh, send it in a stable configuration towards, towards Titan, the same reason that uh, your bicycle is stable when, it, when the wheels are spinning. Uh, Titan's gravity grabbed hold of, um, of the spacecraft, and it started accelerating towards Titan, but then it hit the atmosphere, and the atmosphere of Titan slowed it down because it was traveling at hypervelocity speed. I'm gonna speak fast now because there's a lot of things happening. Uh, because it, 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 it uh, slowed down so intensely, it was heated very intensely, and you could see that the heat shield was heated up. Then this whole choreography had to unfold. There were a sequence of parachutes that had to uh, em uh, open one at a time because the parachute that's large enough to slow down the spacecraft uh, when it just enters the atmosphere is way too big to allow the spacecraft to land uh, safely on the surface. It had to acquire the surface, and all this had to be done robotically. All this had to, the spacecraft had to know all this by itself because Titan is so far away that, um, that we can't joystick this thing around. It takes too long for the, our radio signals to get out there. So the spacecraft needed to know what to do all on its own on, on the way down. Um, the sequence of parachutes had to uh, open one at a time. The spacecraft had to know when it's near the surface in order to release the parachute so it wouldn't uh, fall on top of it. And then eventually it came to rest at a speed that's maybe similar to this one. Um, so, so the spacecraft came to rest on something, and we had to design the spacecraft in such a way that it could land on anything. It, maybe it would land on water ice, maybe it would land on one of those liquid bodies that we knew might exist because we knew there were methane there, but we had never seen the surface until we sent the spacecraft there. So imagine trying to design a spacecraft, send it all the way to the outer solar system, or to a place we had never seen before, and then make sure it lands safely in anything that we, that we hadn't seen. The spacecraft was designed to be positively buoyant, to float in case it landed in a lake, for example. And indeed, this is what the whiteboard at Caltech looked like um, the, on landing day. Okay, we were taking bets on what it was that we were gonna land in. You can see over on the left, uh, several people thought that we would land on this icy crust. So there's a lot of ice in the outer solar system. Most of the satellites are made of ice in the outer solar system. So we thought, okay, maybe we would land on some ice. Uh, a few people thought we would land on this tarry substance, this material that um, accumulates in, in Titan's atmosphere and, then, and, um, and falls on the surface. Um, a few people thought that we might land in liquid. Uh, Carl Sagan hypothesized that there might be vast oceans on Titan uh, from methane and ethane that precipitates and, and forms liquid bodies. So, so, so some people thought we would land in, in one of those liquid bodies. A bunch of people thought that we would land, we would take pictures, but we wouldn't be able to figure out what it was that we were looking at. Um, my student thought we would be dead on arrival, and then a very famous Caltech professor thought we would be eaten when we got there. <laughs> this is what the picture of the landing site that uh, was just a tremendous, tremendous, uh, tremendously exciting to receive uh, on Earth. I remember this. Uh, this was one of the first pictures that were beamed down over on the right uh, that this, the spacecraft took when it landed. Um, we actually ended up landing on, uh, downhill from this extensive drainage system that you see on the left. On the left were the pictures that the spacecraft took on the way down. These were the descent images that were taken one at a time. The spacecraft was sort of turning more than we had expected it. Uh, and that was a pleasant surprise because it allowed us to make a puzzle, like you see here, and then put together the pieces to see the full extent of the drainage system. You see this channel that's carved 
into, this, um, into Titan's uh, crust. And then we landed downhill from there at a place where you can see that there were boulders that must have rolled down. These, I think, I think, we don't know for sure, but I think they're made of ice. And these are big ice boulders that have rolled down the hill, maybe carried by the fluid that carved this channel and were rounded off by the action of being transported down, down river, the same way that pebbles on Earth are rounded by being transported um, in rivers. So again, we, go, we travel to the outer solar system, to a place far away, a world with materials where ice is as hard as rock and methane is liquid, and it's 200 degrees colder, and we find an environment that's strangely familiar to our own. Um, those channels that you see here uh, drain down and, uh, and uh, uh, form lakes in some cases. And here is uh, one lake. This one is called Lake Ontario. It's uh, actually in the southern hemisphere. Uh, of Titan. It's called Lake Ontario. It's about the same size as the one that you're familiar with. And, and again, I hope that you're noticing that there are many features here that are familiar to our own experience here on Earth. You see there are mountains bounding the lake shoreline in the north. And then as we pan around in, the, in this movie, uh, you see that this part of the shoreline is actually um, formed by the wave action eroding the shore and making a very smooth, straight shoreline on that side of the lake. On the other side of the lake, there are actually rivers that are emptying down into the lake. And as we pan around, you'll see that in one case, there's actually a river that's carrying its sediment, carrying the sands uh, down into the lake and depositing them, uh, putting them down when, when, the, when the river hits the lake and forming what on Earth we would call a delta, similar to, say, the Mississippi River Delta. So again, we travel to a land far away, and we see landforms that are strangely familiar. I think I want to show you this picture because uh, it depicts uh, a mission that uh, I hope will fly to Titan. It's currently being proposed uh, to NASA. It's one of the, the three missions NASA is considering. Um, and it depicts a lander. Going back to the way that mankind explored Earth, what we would like to do is send a, a, a lake lander to Titan and actually land in one of those lakes, take a sip of it, measure its composition, take some pictures, measure the depth of the lake, try to understand what role the methane lakes on Titan play in Titan's hydrologic cycle and try to reveal the secrets that Titan is still holding on to. So I'd like to take, uh, to take this in a slightly different direction now and ask, why is it that we do this? Why is it that we invest so much resources, so many resources, time and money in, in exploring other planets, in, in sending spacecrafts buzzing around the solar system? And I think one important answer is the, the question of, life in the universe? Is there life on other planets? And, and I think in a lot of ways, it drives what it is that we do in the space program. So the way I want to parse this question, the way I want to try to answer it, um, is with an equation. And before everybody freaks out, I want you to know that, first of all, it's a very simple equation. And second of all, I don't actually expect anyone to solve this equation. I think the, the, the importance of the Drake equation, that's what it's called, is actually maybe sometimes missed. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it. I actually don't think that the goal is to know what N is, to know how many uh, aliens are likely to make contact with us. Okay? I, I think the Drake equation is really designed in order to organize what it is that we think we know and what it is that we still need to learn about the universe around us in order to answer the question which many of us struggle with. Are we alone? Is there life um, out there? And I think this question is really uh, occupied mankind ever since we had enough time to worry about things beyond eating and reproducing, right? I mean, this was one of the very first sort of philosophical questions that people ask. To what extent can we understand um, the, the formation of life in the universe and, and therefore the formation of our own life here? So N is the number of aliens that we expect to make contact with us, okay? And that number is made up of a bunch of factors that you see here. Um, I'll, I'll take you through them quickly. R is the rate at which stars form. F, P, is the fraction of those stars that have planets. So we're going to take the number of stars that form and multiply it by what fraction have planets. The next factor is the number of those planets that are Earth-like. And then the next factor is the number of those Earth-like planets that actually have life on them. And of those, how many have intelligent life? And of those intelligent life beings, how many of those developed communication capabilities? And then finally, of those life forms that develop communication capabilities, how many survive long enough? L, what's the lifetime of that civilization? Because if they only survive for a minute, then they probably don't have a chance to talk to us. 
So, so these are the factors that go into trying to understand the formation of life in the universe. And, and different factors come from different disciplines. So for example, the rate at which stars form are, and how many of those have planets, is a very active area of research in astronomy now. We have, uh, we have telescopes that look out in the, uh, into the sky and, and measure the rate of star formation and the rate of planet formation. There's factors here that I think are sociological, the rate at which intelligent life forms and whether we choose to educate ourselves or to invest in technology, whether we, the energies that are required to make communication capabilities are also comparable to the energies that are required to destroy ourselves, so whether we're able to survive this uh, period of development and actually communicate with other civilizations. But the factors that interest me as a planetary scientist are these two. Which planets are Earth-like and what we mean by Earth-like? We went all the way to the outer solar system. We thought we would find this strange and hostile place. And then we found a place that has rivers and lakes and climate and climate cycles. So maybe we should rethink what it is that we mean when we say Earth-like in order to ask whether life can take hold there. And then finally, FL is the fraction of planets that have life. The reason why that's important is because right now we don't know. We have one planet that has life on it. It may be that we're a cosmic accident. It may be that it's an extremely rare event for life to form. Or it may be that whenever conditions are right and it's warm and comfortable, that life spontaneously erupts. And if we can find even one more place, one more place where the conditions were right and life formed, then I think the universe is teeming with life. Thank you. <laughs>